Okay. We will discuss chapter 13, uh, diversity of microbes, fungi, and protists today. So let me just hide this. Um, until recently, we only had uh, five kingdoms, animals, plants, fungi, protists, and bacteria. And the base on the uh, differences in cell membrane and ribosomal RNA, we now have three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Both bacteria and archaea are prokaryotes without nucleus or membrane-bound uh, organelles. And all of these are the examples of prokaryotes, ringworm on a skin, trypanosomes, tree mold, a wedge of cheese that's made from uh, obviously uh, or bacteria organism, MRSA, multi-drug resistant Staphylococcus aureus, that's also bacteria, grapes with fungus growing on it, pale pink cup shaped fungi on a log and a corkscrew shaped bacterium seen here and the coral fungus all these are prokaryotes so the prokaryotes probably were, were the uh, first life forms on the earth and they have existed for billions of years before more complex life appeared earth is about 4.5 4 billion years old based on the dating of meteorites, which lacks geological changes that rocks on Earth go through. And at one point, Earth was anoxic, which means no O2, for the first two billion years, and which allowed only anaerobic organisms to survive. And the phototrophic cyanobacteria, which is what blue-green algae are, appeared about 2 billion years after formation of the Earth. And the cyanobacteria fixed the carbon using photosynthesis, which led to oxygenation of the uh, atmosphere. So the first organisms were exposed to harmful radiation from the sun and would have survived better if they were more protected as like under the ocean or under the surface. And they also had to survive harsh temperatures, high temperatures and other high, harsh conditions. And hydrothermal vents is a likely place, place where the first organism have survived. And the, the uh, example of this hot spring, hot spring stream in Yellowstone has cyanobacteria, which is why it appears green. And the water color, uh, color around the edges shows uh, more growth, making it more making it greener, and the micro microbial mats or biofilms made up of multi-layered prokaryotes can actually grow to be a few centimeters thick. And the first microbial mats likely obtained energy from hydrothermal vents, which is a fissure in the, in the surface that releases geothermally heated water. And the microbial mats are shown here. Uh, that points to the chimney allowing the gases to escape on a thermal vent. And if these microbial mats were to fossilize, uh, stromatolite forms, an example of that is shown here. And the fossilized microbial mats are the earliest record on life uh, uh, on Earth. Um, and uh, yeah, so if when the minerals are deposited by microbial nuts, the stromatolites form. Some uh, prokaryotes can grow under conditions that would kill a plant or animal. Uh, bacteria and archaea grow under uh, extreme conditions are called the extremophiles. And these are found in ocean depths, hot springs, very dry places, harsh chemicals, high radiation, Arctic and Antarctic. And these extremophiles may survive other harsher uh, systems in the uh, solar system too, which is what astrobiology seeks to study. 
So extremophiles are used in biotech also in everyday life. For instance, polymerase chain reaction, PCR, cycles between 90 degrees C to 60 degrees C. And that uses an enzyme called TAC. It's a DNA polymerase from an organism called Thermus aquaticus. And the normal proteins will denature at uh, around, yeah, denature at these temperatures, but not TAC because it's from a bacteria from a thermal vent. How do we uh, make alcohol? Fermentation, right? Alcohol level of 12% happens what? That causes, that is the maximum percent of natural fermentation uh, limit. We cannot produce alcohol level above 12%. And acid level is about pH 3.5. And all these uh, met metabolic processes are carried out by extremophiles. So what is a biofilm? Biofilm is a microbial prokaryote and some fungi community that is held together by gummy-like texture matrix that's made from polysaccharides. And the biofilms are present almost everywhere, causing clogs in the pipes, outbreaks of uh, food contaminations. They also colonize household surfaces and tend to be uh, resistant to common forms of sterilization. The, uh, the characteristics of prokaryotes, they have the uh, plasma membrane, cytoplasm, genetic material, and ribosome. And they come in typically three types, cosi, sphere, bacilli, rod, spirilla, it's a spiral. The shapes are shown here. So prokaryotes are unicellular, and lack organelles and have circular oops, have circular uh, chromosome located in the nucleoid region, which is here. Prokaryotes include bacteria and archaea that differ in lipid composition in their cell membrane and the cell wall characteristics. Some archaeal membranes are lipid monolayers, not phospholipid bilayers. And other structures are found in only some prokaryotes. Cap things like capsule, uh, seen here, allows the attachment on the surfaces. And the flagella, seen here, allows for locomotion. And pili allows attachment for conjugation of plasmids, DNA. And the plasmids, are the small circular DNA outside the chrom uh, chromosomes. Plasmid is not shown here, but it's present. So how does uh, bacterial cell wall look like? Uh, it looks like something like this. So cell wall is a protective layer that gives uh, prokaryotes its shape and rigidity. It's located, located outside the cell membrane and pre prevents osmotic lysis. Remember from the lab, uh, hyper versus hypo versus isotonic, right? Cell needs to draw what in, in order to burst. It needs to draw in water. And that's what happens when in osmotic lysis. And that happens when you're in a hypo static, a hypo tonic rather, not hypostatic, but hypotonic solution. Bacterial cell wall contains peptidoglycans, which are the sugar chains linked to the proteins. And they're uh, divided into either gram positive or gram negative based on gram staining. So gram positive bacteria has thick peptidoglycan cell wall outside the cell membrane. Cell membrane is shown here. And the outside of it is the peptidoglycan cell wall. Gram negative bacteria has thin peptidoglycan cell wall, but it's been in between outer and inner membranes. So gram staining must stain what? Gram staining, gram staining stains the peptidoglycan cell wall. And in uh, gram negative, bacteria, crystal violet, 
the stuff you did in the lab just gets washed off. So the reproduction in prokaryotes is asexual and takes place by binary fission. The chromosome replicates and moves to the opposite ends as the cell grows. And the bacteria just pinches off in the middle and the progenies separate. And genetic alteration in prokaryotes come in three different ways. One is transformation that involves taking in DNA found in surroundings and that can turn non-pathogenic bacteria into pathogenic bacteria. There's a transduction, and that's when bacteriophage infects and moves its DNA that it obtained from another bacterium to the bacteria that it's infected. Conjugation that uses pili to bring two different bacteria close, and the DNA is then transferred from one to the other. Then how do the, how do the uh, prokaryotes obtain energy? They're metabo they're metabolically diverse organisms, and they're also part of nitrogen and carbon cycles, uh, which we'll discuss uh, in the later semester. Later in the semester, and they decom decompose dead organisms, and they also grow and multiply inside the living things. And different prokaryotes can use different sources of energy to assemble basically macromolecules from smaller molecules. Where for instance, phototrophs obtain their energy from sunlight. Chemotrophs obtain their energy from chemical compounds. Um, all pathogenic prokaryotes are bacteria. There are no known pathogenic archaea in humans or any other organisms for that matter. So historically speaking, in 430 BC, the plague of Athens killed one quarter of Athenian troops. It was caused by typhoid fever. Between 541 and 750 AD, the plague of Justinian eliminated quarter to half of the human population. The European population declined by 50%. And between 1346 and 1361 AD, the Black Death reduced the world's population by quarter to about 350 to 375 million people. And the Golden Horde army spread uh, the Black Death uh, to Europe during siege of Crimean port of Kappa. The rats were infested with fleas carrying Yersinia pestis. That's the bacteria that causes Black Death. Um, Europeans eventually developed resistance over this, but they also carry the disease to the New World, who, whose population had no resistance. So we are currently in what we call antibiotics crisis. An antibiotic is a organism produced chemical that is hostile to the growth of other organisms. So then why are we getting resistant bugs? The main reason for the resistance is because people overuse them and people, when they use them, they use it incorrectly, not like not completing the full treatment course. And the incorrect use results in the natural selection of resistant bacteria. So antibiotics kills most of the germs, but the only the resistant ones remain and then they repopulate. And the excessive use of antibiotics in livestock also leads to a selection of resistant germ. And the factory farmed animals given, are given antibiotics often as implants or in the, in the feed. So these are the animals that carry pathogenic germs, E. coli, salmonella, staph, et cetera. I made a mistake in, uh, before by calling this uh, multi-drug resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It's actually called methicillin resistant. <clears throat> and this uh, stuff, stuff is um, resistant to methicillin, amoxicillin, 
penicillin and oxacillin. That's a, this crisis will take some time to resolve. And foodborne illnesses are, or food poisoning, and these result from eating food that is contaminated with pathogenic bacteria, viruses, or other parasites. CDC has reports um, showing about 76 million people get sick, more than 300,000 are hospitalized, and 5,000 Americans die each year from foodborne illnesses. Uh, botulism, which is caused by toxin from an anaerobic bacterium called Clostridium botulinium, uh, used to be pretty common. Uh, and it grows anaerobically in cans, jars, which is what we used to use to preserve food. So, and it's sealed, so they just grow. Uh, most food Foodborne illnesses are due to animal waste. The spinach outbreak in 2006 was caused by E. coli 0157H7. This was particularly dangerous uh, strain because it has proteins that ruptures the vessel, blood vessels in the intestinal lining. Uh, its infection route is fecal oral. So they recommend washing your hands Okay, so pathogens are, even though they're a small fraction of the microbial world, they cause a lot of problems. But prokaryotes can be useful too. So, because they use, we use them to make cheese, yogurt, sour cream, vinegar, all these things, cure sausage, sauerkraut. Just about every single uh, civilization have fermented seafood that contain bacteria and archaea. Cheese production began about 4,000 years ago when uh, humans started uh, breeding animals and pro start processing their milk. And there was an old TV show that I saw, and it showed a bakery bakery in France that used no yeast. How, how is that possible? Well, it's possible because the inside air has floating yeast in it. And the known oldest known fermented food is an alcoholic, alcoholic drink made from rice, honey, and fruit from China. This dates back to 7200 BC. Prokaryotes are also used for what we call bioremediation. And it's a process that we use to remove pollutants in the environment. Uh, it's used to remove pesticides, fertilizers, and toxic metals from groundwater. For instance, selenium is found as selenium O4, which has a total charge of minus two. And it, this is reduced by uh, prokaryotes to uh, have zero charges. So it's uh, lose an electron, you're oxidized, gain an electron, you're reduced. So selenium must have gained an electron. It was initially positively charged here. And mercury is also reduced from two plus to zero by bacteria. Some bacteria can degrade oil, and so they're used in oil clean, uh, cleanups, oil spill cleanups. And these were used in Exxon Valdez spill, as well as BP oil spill. Some bacteria produce uh, surfactants to salivalize the oil. Others actually metabolize the oil and produce CO2. Under the ideal conditions, 80% uh, of non-volatile chemicals can be degraded in a year. So, and the first patent application for bioremediation in the U.S. was a GMO, oil-eating bacterium. And we are in a symbiotic relations with germs. There are about 3.8 times 10 to the 13 microbes in a man who weighs about 154 pounds. And he would have about 10, three times 10 to the 13 human cells. So that's about, so we have about as many microbes as uh, our own cells. Uh, in the book, it says 10 to 100 times, which is incorrect. 
So mutually beneficial, uh, gut flora aids in metabolism, synthesis of vitamin K are also meet, uh, carried out by gut flora. Immune system is trained by uh, gut flora for the infants. And in adult immune system, maintenance of it is done by gut flora. It also maintains our gut lining and competition, it provides competition against dangerous pathogens. And our skin is also covered, covered with microbes while not as well studied as gut flora. It shows this uh, microbes on the skin produce antimicrobial compounds that prevents pathogenic infections. And there's actually a, a human microbiome project funded by the NIH to study this relationship further. And the fossil record uh, and genetic evidence suggests that the prokaryotes were the first organisms about 3.5 billion years ago. And they were the only life forms until eukary eukaryotic cells emerged about 2.1 billion years ago. And prokaryotes were able to, to use sunlight to synthesize organic material from carbon dioxide and electron source, such as hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, and water. And the, it's the photosynthetic bacteria that like we talked about earlier that oxygenated the atmosphere, and which at the time had much higher concentration. Anaerobic prokaryotes either perished or survived in an anoxic niches. And others evolved aerobic respiration, which is a much more efficient way of harnessing energy from a carbon source. So few things likely contributed to the origin of uh, uh, eukaryotes, as people think. One, uh, one idea is the endosymbiotic theory. It's the idea that eukaryotes are a product of one prokaryote engulf engulfing another and one living within and both evolving together until they become one eukaryote. And this idea was developed by Lynn Margulis back in 1960s, but it's more accepted now. At the time, not so much. Eukaryotic uh, nuclear genes, replication, transcription, and translation do resemble those of the archaea. And eukaryotic metabolic uh, organelles and genes and energy harvest resemble those of bacteria. So several endosymbiotic event need, events need to contribute to the origin of eukaryotes. And one is mitochondria, and the other is a chloroplast. So mitochondria. Well, eukaryotes have many different many different number of uh, mitochondria. Some have one, others have thousands. The mitochondria itself is about 10 to 1 to 10 micrometers long. It's an oblong spheroid that move, fuse, and divide within the cell. Micro mitochondria cannot survive outside the cell, but are shaped like bacteria, and inner membrane forms crista, like some bacterial structures. And the host cells gain the ability to use oxygen to release energy in carbon, or carbon compounds. But mitochondria, so mitochondria divided by binary fusion, has circular DNA, have its own ribosome and tRNAs. What about chloroplasts? Chloroplasts are one of the plastids, organelles and plant cells that store starches, fats, proteins, and pigments. Plastids are similar to cyanobacteria and two membrane, have two membrane-like membrane system like uh, cyanobacteria. It divides similarly as prokaryotes, also have circular DNA, similar sequence as cyanobacteria, also have their own ribosomes and tRNAs. So, and prochlorococcus is about 0.6 micrometers long, and that's shown here. Uh, it's a cyanobacteria that's responsible for 20% of world's oxygen production. And along with synecococcus, they fix about 50% of world's CO2. And that's more than all tropical forests combined. 
Uh, chloroplast is about five to 10 micrometers in size. So in the symbiosis, my, mitochondria may have evolved before plastids because all eukaryotes have mitochondria. Plastids are only found in algae and plants. And so one hypothesis dealing with endosymbiosis is shown in this diagram here. Now, exact steps leading to the first eukaryotes is obviously unknown and it's quite controversial. But first eukaryotes were unicellular, like most protists today. And uh, as eukaryotes became more complex, multicellularity allowed the cell to remain small while having specialized functions. And the endosymbiotic just posits that mitochondria and uh, chloroplasts were engulfed like this and became modern photosynthetic eukaryote, shown in the diagram here. So what are protists? Uh, eukaryotes that do not fit into animal, plant, or fungi kingdom are the protists. And they include include a single cell versus various terrestrial sing, uh, single cell various terrestrial and aquatic environments. Some are, but uh, happen to be multicellular, like kelp. Some are more rel related to animals, plants, or fungi than other protists. As a group, they display. Uh, variety of uh, morphologies, physiologies, and ecologies. Shown here are the single cell uh, acanthocystis terfasia. I'm not going to say the names, but here's a ciliate. And here's a kelp forest shown here. So what are some characteristics of protists? Most protists exist, exist in aquatic environment or damp soil or in the snow. Some are parasites, others are decomposers. Their structures are among the most elaborate as seen in previous picture. And most are microscopic and unicellular. Some live in colonies behaving like single cell or multicellular organisms. Many are multinucleated. So their sizes range from one micrometer to three meter like seaweed. Some developed animal-like cell membrane or plant-like cell wall. Some have glossy silica shell. Others have pellicles, a protein that acts as an armor. Uh, some have more than one flagella. Others have cilia, and yet others move by pseudopodia. Um, how do they obtain energy? They also uh, exhibit in many different forms of uh, nutrition, you're including aerobic and anaerobic. The photoautotrophs fix carbon using light. Some heterotrophs, like amoeba, eat organic materials using phagocytosis to form the vacuole that fuses with lysosome to break down the food. So here's a food particle. It gets phagocytosed fuses with lysosome containing digestive enzymes. And then waste is extruded out using exocytosis. Then how do they reproduce? They reproduce by in many different ways. Fission uh, produces two or more progenies, budding, where a tiny bud grows off, off to the adult size, and it pinches off the parent. Some protists can switch between asexual and sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction in protists uh, is more common when resources are low or environmental changes. Because sexual reproduction allows the, 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 allows the recombination of genes and produce different progenies that may or may not survive the changes in the environment. And uh, sexual reproduction often produces cysts in a resting stage. And these cysts are more resistant to changes in the temperature, pH, moisture, et cetera. 
and due to the size, also it, it almost has it has almost no metabolism. And it just sits there uh, until the, the environment changes. So how diverse are uh, protists? Sequencing allowed uh, correctly identifying relations among protists. Um, protists with morphological similarities have analog analogous structures that may have evolved from convergent evolution. New scheme groups like eukaryota into six super groups containing all protists, animal, uh, plants, and fungi. And that is shown. I guess not that part of the yeah, that is shown here. One, two, three, four, five, and six. And each of these six groups believe to be uh, are believed to be monophyletic, phyletic, meaning they have each groups of one single ancestor and similar to each other than outside groups. Uh, prokaryotes also make up uh, human pathogens. For instance, plasmodium species are a intracellular protist. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, did I say prokaryotes? I meant to say protists, protist pathogens. So protist parasite that causes malaria. And the plasmodium is transmitted by a mosquito bite, and the parasite develops in the liver, then infects the red blood cells, causing it to burst, releasing more parasites. And malaria can cause can destroy more than half of the red blood cells in circulation, and that causes severe anemia. And host also mounts massive inflammatory response to the parasite's waste product, and that leads to delirium inducing fever. These purple dots inside the red blood cells are the P. falciparum. Palsy, no, P. falciparum. Sorry, misspoke. So another uh, protist pathogen is uh, trypanosome. T. brucei is a protist parasite that causes African sleeping sickness. And you can ev evade the immune system by changing the sur surface glycoprotein with each infection cycle. Uh, you can replicate without immune system ever catching up. Uh, if untreated, this can lead to death due to damages to the nervous system. And whereas trypanosome cruzi causes Chagas disease, which affects the heart and digestive system, leading to heart failure and malnutrition. And T. brucei is shown here in red among the red blessings. <coughs> uh, protists also make, uh, also function as, some protists also function as parasites of plants. They can destroy food crops. Um, Plasmopara viticola causes downy mildew, seen here, the light spots, in the gray plants, and it makes them stunted. And this nearly collapsed the French wine industry in the 19th century. Phytophthora infesta. These names are really difficult. <laughs> Causes the uh, potato late blight and makes them decay into black slime as seen here. This was the cause of Irish famine in the 19th century where one million died and the other million migrated to the US. But there are some uh, protests that are also beneficial. Some protists are used as food source as, plank as plankton, what it's what eats plankton, 
all the fish, shrimp, and many, many different things. And there are also photosynthetic dinoflagellates that fix carbon for other organisms, like coral polyps in symbiosis. And the coral polyps collect these uh, photosynthetic uh, dinoflagellates inside the surface of their, their tentacles during development. So these are the tentacles of poly uh, coral polyp seen here. And inside their surface, they collect these photosynthetic protists. And the coral polyps typically reside no deeper than 20 meters. Any deeper, these uh, photosynthetic dinoflagellates do not get some, uh, enough sunlight. Why is that bad? because it has to carry out photosynthesis. That was the entire point. So they don't survive beyond 20 meters. So photosynthetic protists are the primary producer and the feed large part of aquatic species. About a quarter of photosynthesis is by protists, dinoflagellates, diatoms, and algae. Uh, protists in the gut of termite have bacteria inside them that digest cellulose. So termite eats the food, so, uh, wood, the protists, and the bacteria inside, in turn, provide sugar to the termite. And many fungus-like protists are saprobes, meaning they feed on dead things or waste, and they return the nutrient back to the soil and water. And this re uh, generates resources for other organisms all along the food chain. Without saprobes, protists, fungi, and bacteria, all nutrient will be tied up in the dead. So what are fungi? Fungi is Latin for mushroom. There are about 135 species of fungi and have been identified and probably more than uh, 1.5 million species are present, but they have they have not been identified. Uh, edible mushrooms, yeast, black mold, penicillin, penicillium rather. These are all fungi, and the DNA show that they're more closely related to animals than plants. And these are saprobes using organic compounds as source of energy, and and carbon. And most fungi produce spores during uh, sexual reproduction, and they often form mutualistic association with other organisms. But it can also cause infections. Uh, American elm tree were decimated by a Dutch elm disease, which is caused by fungi. And the human fungal infection are also challenging because they don't respond to antibiotics. Fungi are eukaryotes so they don't respond to antibiotics. And obviously food industry uses yeast for fermentation, biotech uses for making enzymes, antibiotics, and so on. So what kind of cells do they have? They have very complex cell structures. They have the nucleus, mitochondria, ER, and Golgi, because they're uh, eukaryotes. Some even have plasmids, just like bacteria. They do not have chloroplasts, but pick pigments for making them bright in colors. And these are often, the bright colored fungi are often poisonous. Fungi of cell wall made up of chitin and glucan. And these are uh, polysaccharides. And the fungal membrane contains orgosterol instead of cholesterol, like animals. And most fungi are non-motile, they don't move. And here's shown is Amanita muscaria, which is native to North America and is poisonous. Notice the bright red color. Um, how do they grow? How the this vegetative body, the fungus, is called the talus and can be uni or multicellular. Yeast and candida, candida causes thrush and fungal infection, are unicellular fungi. And the vegetative stage shows like tangle-like hypha that are amassed into mycelium. 
and it can grow on surface, soil, dead, or living tissue. And the honey mushroom in Oregon might be the largest organism spreading over 2,000 acres. And the mycelium of Neotestudina rosati can be pathogenic to humans, that's shown here. And this fungus, <clears throat> fungus enters through cut or scrape and develops into mycetoma, which is a chronic subcutaneous infection. And most hypha are divided into cells by septa, a cell wall which can be perforated to allow movement of nutrients. And those are shown here in diagram form. And here's a microgram. Bread mold have sinocytic, sino, common, cytic cell, hypa, that have no septa and are multinucleated. And the fungi typically thrive in moist and slightly acidic places. So here's A showing septated hypha. Here's a B showing sinocytic hypha. And Phyalophora ricartsia has septated hypha shown here. So how do they grow? They grow in oxygen requirement, with oxygen requirement, with some some uh, needing oxygen to survive, others dying in oxygen. Yeast is in between. You can use fermentation. Uh, some can reproduce sexually or asexually through production of pores, spores. It's shown here giant puffball mushroom cloud release a cloud of spores numbering in trillions upon reaching the maturity there's a diagram or drawing rather of uh, spores being released bunch are heterotrophs that have to obtain carbon and nitrogen from food and they release exoenzyme enzyme outside the cell out of, out of the hypha to break down the nutrients in the surrounding, which are absorbed into the mycelium. There are also saprobes. They uh, get nutrients from decaying matter, able to and, and sapro they're uh, to break down cellulose and lignin into glucose. Some can even break down diesel and polycyclic or aromatic hydrocarbons. Some can take up heavy metals like cadmium and lead. So these might be useful for bioremediation. And the kingdom of fungi contain four major divisions, phyla, and they're quite diverse. Based on, and that division is based on mode of sexual reproduction. They are chytrids, conjugated fungi, sac fungi, club fungi, glomeromycota is a brand new uh, group that's been identified. And uh, our ribosomal uh, sequencing continues to change the uh, classification in this group. And here are some of the divisions that are shown here. A, chytrids, shown here. B, conjugated fungi. C, sac fungi. And D, club fungi. Um, <clears throat> most of the plant pathogens are fungi that cause tissue uh, decay and eventual death of the host. They can also spoil crops by producing toxin and spoil the and then spoil the store food uh, and crops. Uh, Claviceps pur purpurea causes erga, which is an infection of cereal crops. Its lysergic acid, LSD precursor, causes ergotism with convulsion, hallucination, gangrene, 
and loss of milk in cows. <clears throat> Here's the green mold on grapefruit shown here. Uh, fungus on a grape here. Uh, powdery mildew growing on a zinnia. And the stem rust on a sheaf of barley shown. Last. Note the uh, Botrytis cinerea causes the noble rot resulting in sweet dessert wines. That's the uh, grape fungus. A bottle of uh, Saturnus, Google says, costs about $29.99 to $595. It's an expensive wine. So fungi also infect humans and animals uh, by colonizing and destroying the tissues. And we can also be poisoned. Humans and animals can also be poisoned by ingesting the fungi or the contaminations. Individuals can also develop allergies to mold and spores. And fungal infections are difficult to treat because fungi are eukaryotes and there's no antibiotics. Uh, Fungal infection or mycoses typically are on skin, hair, and nails, where dermatophytes can break down the keratin in the skin, hair, and nail, and cause ringworms, athlete's foot, jock itch, and other infections. Uh, while these can be treated with over the counter medication, some require more serious interventions. Systemic mycoses spread to internal organs via most commonly entering the respiratory system. The valley fever, as in central valley, is caused by histoplasma capsulatum and shows symptoms similar to tuberculosis. And opportunistic mycoses are common in environment or normal, normal biota but they affect those with compromised immune systems. Here's a ringworm shown here, scalp my mycosis shown here, and the valley fever infected lung shown here. The arthrobotrous fungi can be predators of nematodes or the round forms with using their hypha network as a constricting ring to trap the trap the round worm, then it digests uh, the worm using a specialized hypha. <clears throat> but there are some beneficial fungi. Um, they're important to ecosystems. Fungi recycle carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus back to the environment. They can also break down cellulose and lignin, releasing glucose. And if they form association with plants called mycorrhiza, myco, fungus, rhiza, root, to collect water and mineral from soil to the plant. And the plant, plant supplies glucose to the fungus. About 80 to 90% of plants have such fungal partners. Lichens have hypha wrapped around the cyanobacter or algae. So lichens break down the rocks into soil and provide protection and minerals to the phototropes, while phototropes provide the nutrient to the lichen. Uh, fungi also have mutualism with insects. Leaf cutting ants actually farm fungi using the leaves, which fungi break down into sugar. Ants then eat the sugar. This is supposed to say sugar. Um, fungi are important to uh, human life on many levels. They help nutrient cycle in the ecosystem. Without it, all the nutrients will be in the dead things. Fungi also help control population of damaging pests. That they could potentially be used as insect insecticide. Fungi are essential for farming without without which 90% of plants would not survive. We also eat fungi, mushrooms, 
yeast and fermentation, penicillium in blue cheese, and the, uh, the metabolites from fungi are used in many applications. Antibiotics are a natural way for fungi to kill off bacteria, to limit competition. And many antibiotics come from fungi. For instance, cyclosporin used to reduce organ injection, precursor of steroid hormone, and ergoalkaloids to stop the bleeding are all isolated fungi. And some are, uh, and some like yeast and candida, they're also used in research. You know what, let's stop there.